From the John Nevada Broadcast Center, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another broadcast of Armchair Experts with Jim Leon and Rich Nassaro on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network. And now, here's Jim and Rich. Ah, uh, moving and grooving another night. I, tell you, I like that music. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, it's very relaxing. All right, off and running, another edition of the, what are we? The Armchair Experts. Yeah. I almost began to call us that thing that Kerry Cox called us, and I don't think Yeah, you don't want to do that. We'll be I don't want to do that. off the air by Kevin. We'll be I know. Off. Another 60 minutes of uh, ruminations, cogitations, intimations, insinuations. I have to look up some more... Some more Asians. <laughs> Some more Asians to describe that. So we we don't we didn't even do a show prep. But no, probably nobody's surprised about that. No, we, because when we do a show prep, it doesn't sound like we did a show prep. So I know. Yeah. So I I don't know what what's what's on your mind. I think we should uh, talk a little Bears football because uh, uh, you know everybody's talking about the fact that they're two and zero, oh, but realize how close they were to be going <laughs> to had a big article about it in the in the paper today and uh you know what the the players and the coaches said it the right way it's better better to be 2 and 0 and off to this type of start than oh, you know 0 and 2 with a new coaching staff then all of a sudden the questions start automatically so 2 and 0 that's a great uh, way to start and you know, I'd rather uh rather do it the way they did it uh then you know they're exciting games. I guess you'd they're, say they're exciting games. I I'm impressed with Mark Trestman. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very very cerebral he's approach. He's going to stay the, the course. He's going to stay the course. Um, he's you know he's fixed things. He's doing it quickly. The offensive line is much better. That's the most impressive stat, Jim. They've yeah. had one sack in two games, and you got two rookies. Yeah, two rookies. Now, so, yeah. now, what really bothers me is uh, uh, the 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 pass rush, the defensive on the defensive line. The pass rush has been like non-existent. Well, if they, if they uh, I, I'm going to go back to, to one, what we said in a previous show. Uh, you know, the papers like to knock Peppers because uh, they, uh, supposedly his stats last year weren't what they thought they should be. And Henry Melton ends up going to the uh, Pro Bowl. Henry Melton, but yeah. how much of Henry Melton's success could you uh, lay on on Peppers? Now True. Peppers is off True. to. Uh, I know that he was sick on Sunday, even mm-hmm. though he played, and I don't know he might be a little banged up as well. So I, I think he's the key guy there. I, I think it's going to be it, it's going to be interesting to uh, watch the game Sunday night against Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. Now we're recording this on Tuesday. Tuesday, whatever date this is, Tuesday the 17th. Mm-hmm. Did you watch any of the game last night between um, uh, the Monday night game between Cincinnati and Pittsburgh? No, who won the game? Uh, Cincinnati. Okay. Pittsburgh is horrible. Really? Pittsburgh is horrible. Their offensive line is terrible. Okay. A- and I never thought I would um, uh, see a, a, a Steeler team, which always has had the uh, tradition of a big banger. Mm-hmm. Running back. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, Jerome Bettis, Franco Harris, sure, uh, even uh, Richard Mendenhall mm-hmm. from his stuff, from his day, uh, from his days, who's now in uh, Atlanta, I believe. Uh, and uh, uh, now they got uh, a cowboy reject, a little running back, Felix Jones. Oh, that's the running back. Okay, that, you know, you know what I, I would say though, Jim. Beware of uh, you know when you have you, you think you have a patsy because they look so bad. Right, then look out because right. that's not always what happens. Are they right. playing in Pittsburgh? They're playing in Pittsburgh. Uh, that's the Sunday night game this this coming week. Well, I think you have a coach too there, and Mike Tomlin. That's not going to be happy with a uh, mediocre performance and if there's any way of uh, ginning them up uh, to a better performance I'm sure he'll he'll be attempting that during the week yeah I mean as and as I look at this as I glance down at the uh, at the odds for uh, uh, next week 
for the Bears. <laughs> the Bears are a two-point favorite. <laughs> yeah, well. So again, you know, you're 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 looking at uh, you're looking at what was done, and you were looking at a at a team that has played well, stayed stayed within themselves, stayed the course, mm-hmm. but not exactly spectacular. They're yeah. good. They're good. They're yeah. a pretty good ball club. Yeah, I, d- I don't know what the Steelers are, but I think the Bears are a work in progress, and I think uh, it'll take a while before the product looks totally finished. So uh, count it a blessing that we're 2-0 and as we're, we're making this progress. And uh, I, I would say, you know, hats off a little bit to everybody, coaches, players, and whoever yeah. else you want to take your hats yeah. off to. Yeah, and, and I mean, I'm, uh, you're watching, I'm watching Cutler. And, and he's playing. There've been a couple of times when you've looked and you'd say, "What do you do that for?" Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. one of the interceptions when he threw it right to somebody, and he realized he described the fact that he made a mistake, you know, and he's taking he's taking his own responsibility for it. Well, if you know, if he's not being sacked and he's not being, and I haven't seen either of the two games, so if, I don't know if he's being hurried or not, but. You know, I, I assuming or by what you say that he's not being hurried and he understands that if he's getting the protection and he throws a pick, then that's his mistake. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's, I a, mean, that's he, a good thing. He described one last time as uh, it was in the uh, Bengals game that his drop was too far. Mm-hmm. He took that on himself. He says, I dropped back too far. He okay. said, that was my, that was my problem. And, again, looking at this, last year uh, Jay Cutler was sacked 38 times in 434 passing attempts. And that's a sack for every 11th attempt. Yeah, yeah. And he has so far what he's, he's once, been sacked once in how many attempts? W- once in 72 attempts. Wow, a lot of attempts. Yeah, yeah, in two games. I'm going to throw this little trivia item out, and you can think about this. Throw, a little, to... throw, throw a little one out. All right, the, the topic, former Bear quarterbacks for 100, Alex. Oh, okay. This former Bear quarterback just exceeded 50,000 yards passing in his career. He just ex- he's, he's still playing, in other words. Yes. Uh, All right. Put yeah. me on, buddy. All right. You can. It's probably, uh, wait a minute now. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. I, it's Henry Burris. You got it. Henry <laughs> Burris up in Canada. Henry Burr and he's only the fifth quarterback in the Canadian Who's League. Who's he playing for? Uh, do you know? He was playing for... Is it Edmonton or something? I think he's playing for Edmonton now. Yeah, I thought I saw him a couple of years ago on TV. Yes. I, you know, uh, speaking of uh, Edmonton and the Eskimos, I'm reading this, a book about the Steagles, you mm-hmm. know, the, uh, the, f- the, the team that uh, combined Pittsburgh and Philly team uh, in World War II. And did you know... Now, this is something I never knew. The, the, the Washington Redskins... Uh, now, you know, we all know that the Atlanta Braves were first the Boston Braves, and mm-hmm. you know that the uh, Dallas Texans or the Houston uh, or Kansas City Chiefs were the Dallas Texans, and so on and so forth. Did you know that the Washington Redskins started off as the Duluth Eskimos? That one I did not know. I knew Washington at one. The Redskins one time played for one time played, I believe, in Boston. They played in Boston. Uh, what happened? The, the way I read it is uh, a guy by the name of uh, Oli, Oli, Oli Hogsrud bought the Eskimos for $1 in 1926. Mm-hmm. They, they proceeded, they played 20-some games, all of them except one away from home. Mm-hmm. Uh, only 12 of them were NFL games where they finished 6-5-1, and one, but they were playing the games, obviously, uh, for the bottom line. And uh, when Ali finally sold the uh, the team to uh, George Preston Marshall, as you said, originally he was going to put the team in Newark. They ended up in Boston. I think it was about nineteen, want to say thirty-two. Yeah, something Moved like to Washington. That. A little but about thirty-six or thirty-seven. The bottom line on the story was, and what made it interesting, I think, uh, you know, Hogsrud, Hogsrud, or however you say his name, bought the franchise for a mil for a, a, a buck. In 1999, Daniel Snyder <laughs> bought the Redskins for 800 million bucks. <laughs> so uh, quite a uh, quite an increase in the value of the franchise. You know that. Just think about think about that. I I I laughed. Uh, I laughed when I worked in the um, Hancock Building a number of years ago, 
a lot of radio stations in the Hancock building. And across the street, or across the hall from our office was the light at that time. Yeah. 100.3, whatever they were. Okay. Whatever they were uh, calling themselves. And they had just been sold to uh, uh, Evergreen, Mm -hmm. uh, which was the Loop. Okay. And I used to see the owner of the light a lot of times in the hall, an older man, George. And after it, after the uh, after the announcement of it, we were leaving one night, and I saw George, and I said, "Nicely done," on that. And he looked at me and he said, "Do you know what the negotiations were like?" I said, "No." He said, "Jimmy DeCastro walked into my office and said, George, how much do you want for the station?'" He said, "I said the first number that popped into my head. I said seventy-seven million." And Castro, DeCastro said, okay, drop the papers, and turned around and walked out. Oh, that's a, <laughs> that's a good negotiation. Man. And, and then he told me, he said in 1964 or 67, when he and his partner bought it, they paid like $500,000 for the station. You know, as you're saying that, and I see James here in the uh, control booth, and obviously he's a Ridgewood student. And I, I remember uh, my kids being, they were young in high school when United was going through their uh, bankruptcy. Mm-hmm. And I remember when the Sun Times still actually was a paper with some news in it. They had a business <laughs> section, and uh, instead of this, instead of this little yeah, the little the little this cute little and, thing that we have that they have here. Yeah, uh, uh, the lead attorney, and there were there were numerous law firms uh, involved, obviously, with a, a huge company like United. The lead attorney, though, was billing out Jim at over a thousand dollars an hour. Mm-hmm. And I said to my kids, you know what? You can, you know what? Uh, you could work at the park for nine bucks an hour. You can work at the airport for twelve bucks an hour. Why don't you consider going into the law? Because you know, not everybody's going to bill out That's at right. a grand an hour. But you know what? You can, you can bill out at a pretty good uh, uh, chunk of change, even if you're not the, the lead lawyer on the United uh, bankruptcy. That's right. I mean, I remember an old joke about a attorney who died and went to heaven. It can happen. Mm-hmm. And Saint Peter looked at him and said. You know, how old are you, young man? And he said, well, I was killed in an accident. I'm only 36 years old. He says, well, based on your billings, he said, you should be about 94. Uh, you know, yeah. nothing nothing like talking on the phone for five minutes and billing somebody for a quarter of an hour. Uh, it's <laughs> it's amazing. You know, I, I, I always uh, think to myself, if you're an ent- entity, you're a business, and you have a law firm on retainer, you're paying them, but then when you pick up the phone to call them, you're paying them again. So I'm un- I, I always am curious what is the retainer for? Just for the uh, uh, what the uh, satisfaction of of knowing that they're your attorneys. You know what the I the guess. pride of I knowing guess. that such and such a firm is your attorney. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Going back to um, going back to the Bears. I'm hap- just happened to glance here at Hubarkush's column. Hubarkush. The hub. The hubster. And he grades them out. Mm-hmm. And he says, sure, the Bears are 2-0, and but they aren't as good as other undefeated teams. Uh, I think he's giving them, like, a B or something. A B. Tight ends get a B. You know, and it's nice that Martellus Bennett, you realize Martellus Bennett in two games has caught more touchdowns than all the, than the tight ends did last year, or has caught as many. Well, he better. I mean, that's what they brought him that's in what for, they, I'm that, assuming. This is what they brought him in here for. And it's nice to see uh, it, It's nice to see some, a tight end that can actually catch the ball. Mm-hmm. And, and, I, and I looked at, and I was watching, and I, I did not watch the whole game on Sunday. Okay. I saw the second half, a good part of the second half. But it's fun to watch Devin Hester. Just concentrating on that, and he seems to be very energized. He seems to be very into what he's doing now, mm-hmm. as to whatever whatever was going on last year. And, and I think, and I think it might have been, uh, uh, it might have been. I, I mean, he had some great returns on Sunday. Uh, on Sunday, and I think some of it was to try to show off for the fact that even though the Bears gave up a hundred and five yard touchdown on the opening kick that Devin Hester was still around. Sure. He returned more yard he he had more return yardage uh in the game Sunday. He set a bear record. Oh he did. I didn't he, know. Yeah, that. he set a bear record for kick return yardage uh this past Sunday. 
again, the thing that bothers me the most from what I've seen right now is uh, the defensive line. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and I don't know. I guess here here's something that uh, on on this coming Sunday that we can watch and see. Maybe it maybe it'll give us an idea where they are. Maybe it'll just indicate that there's more problems. Uh, but with a with a mediocre with the mediocre line that Pittsburgh has, if they can't do anything on Sunday against it, then obviously we've got some problems. I'm just looking here. Julius Peppers, Henry Melton, Stephen Paia, and Corey Wooten each managed one tackle. One tackle. Okay. And all Shea McClellan could do was notch an assist. The pass rush was absolutely non-existent. Linebackers didn't play didn't play too bad. I, I thought they did well in the secondary, did well, and I see the hub gives them a grade of B just only because of Tim Jennings' uh, interception return. He gave them a grade of B? A B. What did he give the defensive line, if I can ask? C, and he called that generous. Yeah. Well... I don't know what type of. Uh, I, I assume that the Vikings, though, have a pretty good offensive line. They do have one of the most aptly named offensive linemen, uh, uh, Phil Lodeholt, <laughs> which I love. <laughs> I mean, a, that's a great they're, name they're, for they're, an offensive lineman. Oh, and that, I love it. That kind of goes along with D liner on our college team. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, but, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I would say, again, it's a work in progress. I don't think that the defense, other than uh, maybe the first half of the season, was that overwhelming last year. I think they played well, but they played well against the lesser teams. They didn't play quite as well against the good teams. So they may be even more of a work in progress than the uh, than the offense. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the offense has made some pretty rapid strides, but they've had more of an infusion of new personnel than the defense has. Mm-hmm. So, and I, I I can tell you this, though, what you're saying to me makes me realize all those years, Jerry Angelo and Lovey Smith continued to draft defensive linemen. They, I mean, every year it was, a, you know, another defensive tackle, defensive end. And, you know, if the defensive line is not getting the job done, I can see why they continue to tinker with it because even at this point, uh, you know, and I don't think other than Peppers, really, I'm going to say this, I don't think they have a, a, a big gun on the defensive line. No, I mean, he's the they guy, don't. And he's getting a little long in the tooth. He's he. You know, you're probably looking at another year, mm-hmm. or with him. I don't know if Shea McClellan is going to pan out yet. Mm. But you know, the usual thing with a draft pick, you're really going to have to look at three years. Yeah. To see if they actually pan out. Yeah. And uh, um, I, I think um, f- uh, Phil uh, uh, Phil Emery hit a home run uh, with with the draft this year. Mm-hmm. Kyle Long certainly. I I think I think people are surprised how fast Kyle Long came on. Mm-hmm. The fact that he's starting now and playing pretty doggone well. Well, did you? I, I'm th- well. Kyle Long, I think, is. Uh it's almost as if he was uh, he had a little bit of veteran in him already. He's 25. He comes from a football family. I think he gets it, and he understands the game pretty well. And you know, uh, just understanding what the Bears are doing in particular is probably the the one big hurdle he's got to uh, got to climb because physically he's definitely able to handle himself. And the rest of the thing is, uh, you know, getting what's actually happening there on offense. Mm-hmm. I, I have to go go back to Shea McClellan a little bit and say I always said when the Bears had uh, who was our guy that uh, from Texas that uh, had some pro- uh, Cecil uh, what the, am I got the right name uh, Stan um, uh, boy what's his name the guy the guy was with the uh, he was with the Bengals he might be with the Packers now uh, can't think of his name oh um, um, the running back yeah the running back. Uh, well, what I, I right I can't think. Of I his tried name. to block it. I tried to block him out of my. Uh, uh, but I always said that you know, if you remember, I was he was he was here and uh, Thomas, uh, uh, another guy I'm not going to be able to remember who was the guy Thomas Jones. Thomas Jones. Right. Thomas Jones who was an excellent uh, football player, a real hard nosed guy. I think a really a guy I thought was going to be nothing and came here and really impressed me. But they were trying to to. Uh, uh, 
divide the the carries between those two guys, mm -hmm. which might have been fine for Thomas Jones, but for the other guy, you know, when you talk about a big Texas style running back, there's a guy who's used to getting the ball. You know, if he gets it 15 times, maybe even 20 times, he and, and he's struggling. He's a guy who is strong. And probably by that 25th to 30th time, he's just getting ahead of steam, and now he's going to start to beat on the defense the same way they were beating on him, and he's eventually going to break the defense. Mm -hmm. I, I, Shea McClellan may be in the same uh, sort of boat. Uh, when he was at Boise State, he's the guy, he's an every down guy. With the Bears, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this because uh, the guy that he's sharing time with, Corey Wooten, I think definitely deserves time, but... I think it's maybe hard. Some guys can do it, some guys can't. But it might be hard for him to get that rhythm to be as effective as he needs to be. So, yes, is he playing? Yes, is he filling a spot? Sure. But to be effective, maybe when, when he'll be effective is when Julius Peppers finally uh, retires. And those guys might be on either side of the line now mm -hmm. instead of sharing instead time of, on one side. And he may become a, a much better uh, player. Yeah. Because you know, because sometimes it just takes the 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 game repetition after repetition for you to to get rolling. Some guys yeah. are like that. What do you think of uh, Matt Forte's play? Oh, well, you didn't see the game Sunday. You you no. said. I I think from what I've seen, Forte is finally being used effectively. Mm -hmm. I mean, he had um, nineteen rushes. I mean, he had 30 touches on Sunday. Rushed the ball 19 times, 11 receptions. Mm -hmm. He had 161 yards of total offense on Sunday. Yeah, that's what I understand. So, I mean, I think he's finally being effectively used. N not that he wasn't a good running back before, but, I mean, the fact that it's just another um, a a another tool mm -hmm. that Cutler can use. Oh, that's for sure. Now, are they are they lining them up? I my understanding is they were going to line them up as a wide out at times. As They've well. lined them up. I think I've seen them lined up as a wide out. I've seen them in a you know single back. Uh, I think it's the smart thing to do because if you have a guy that you think is that talented, uh, then in order f to you know to try to keep the defense from having a real good focus on him, that's probably a good idea. I mean, if you have the talent that uh, Forte has, and he obviously has the talent to both run with the ball and receive the ball, so mm -hmm. uh, that's a good way to use him. Now, mm -hmm. if you had Jimmy Brown, you probably wouldn't use him that way. No. I mean, you're going to no. use him the way he needs to be used. Uh, I mean, the days, do you think the days, and I wanted to get into this because I wanted the, to talk Cedric about Benson is the guy. Cedric Benson, thank you. Yeah. Uh, but I was thinking about, uh, you, you know, you don't see the big, and you mentioned Jim Brown, uh, you don't see the big fullbacks. That's true anymore. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about that, uh, especially the other day, um, when I saw one of the one of the one of the good ones from back in the fifties and sixties uh, passed on, uh, uh, Rick Caseras. I, I, you know, I saw. I just I went on uh, I went online last night to see what I could find on on, the, on Rick in general, and I didn't realize he's still the third. According to at least what I read, still the third, third? leading all-time Bears rusher. Right, behind uh, uh, Walter Payton and Neil Anderson. Now, he uh, actually uh, he actually went to five Pro Bowls and was uh, all all pro one mm -hmm. year. Uh, but I, from my understanding, I, I uh, not too long ago, I read Paul Horning's uh, biography, and those two were tight. They got, I mean, Paul uh, Paul Horning uh, was a guy who would have loved to play in Chicago. He loved Chicago. Mm -hmm. And he and Rick Caceres got along, so you know that, uh, where <laughs> those guys are coming from. That's a dangerous <laughs> proposition. But he also said that Rick Caceres was one of the toughest uh, guys to put on pads. And I know that when I was a kid, I remember reading a, an article. It was in Sports Illustrated or, or uh, not Sports, but maybe this uh, sport magazine, where Caceres had played one year with uh, broken ribs. And, I was, well, you know, as a kid, that doesn't... Uh, you know, it doesn't phase you one or the other. But then, when you realize as an adult, that's a, that's one of the most painful things just to walk around. Mm -hmm. And this guy is playing a professional football game with broken ribs. You know how and, tough Rick Caceres was, and and getting hit. 
<laughs> yeah, you're getting uh, well. I mean, that's that's what I mean. He's you know. Yeah. But he was a very a very tough guy. He, he's a guy that you want uh, next to you in a fight if you're on the field or off. And very well respected guy. Very well respected. Um, when I saw the uh, item about it, I went online to see what sort of news I could find, and and uh, apparently his. His wife came home from groceries and picking up something at Wendy's, mm-hmm. and walked in the front door and saw him. When she where where she left him, sitting at his desk because he was studying the studying the 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 uh, point spreads and everything for the games on the weekend okay. and looking at that, and he passed away while she was gone. One more of the sixty three group that was. Uh that's past now. Yeah, uh, l- l- and that was the, and that was the day before. That was the day, day or two before the uh, reunion. Now we're supposed to be the experts. Let me ask you this: I, Who ended up winning the Washington Illinois game? Washington. I sort of figured they would, but they, it was a, a close game, right? It was a close game. Uh, I actually, I, I've heard comments that it it maybe it was not as close as the score appeared. Or maybe it was the other way. Maybe it was the other way. I love those kind of comments. Maybe it, maybe it <laughs> was, you know, maybe it was the other way around. I don't remember at that point in time. But um, I mean, I had uh, uh, at that day, that day I had spent, I had spent the, uh, I had spent the day watching uh, uh, Michigan State or Michigan escape with their lives against Akron. Oh, okay, that's what, okay. Uh, of all people, Akron, huh? Akron, the who, Zips. The Zips, who have been Zip for I don't know how many years on the road, mm-hmm. and and uh, had Michigan dead to rights and got screwed out of eight seconds on the clock when they were when they were at the one. Oh wow! Well, uh, think about this, Jim. Uh, uh, the, you know, uh, how about uh, think go back to the grade that he's giving the Bears because uh, maybe they're not as impressive as other undefeated teams. But think about it this way. Michigan had a big emotional victory over Notre Dame the opening week. Mm-hmm. They come back to play, and they play Akron. And, I, you know, it's easy to say, well, you know what, these are big-time college football players, and, you know, they should be able to get up for every game. But it's easier said than, than done. Yeah. So uh, the point would be, okay, they escaped, luckily, to, to with a win for Akron. I think that, that using that same type of uh, thinking – the Bears had a really close game and pulled one out against the Bengals the opening week. Uh, the same thing could apply to the Bears. They they could have maybe had a little letdown against the Vikings. The Vikings lost their opening game, and they weren't that impressive against the Lions, from what I understand. Uh, the Bears could have uh, maybe taken them lightly. I think the most impressive th- thing about the second week win is that you got another good effort coming off a pretty nice victory uh, the first week, and I think that's a good thing. So, so, so take the fact that they had to come back. Take the fact that they've only won the two games by a total of what four points or something mm-hmm. like that. I think you can throw some of that out the window. And this week, again, it'll be critical because I think what happens that the the successful teams are able to have some kind of a consistent effort through the season regardless of big wins, big losses, whatever, the the ability for you to come back and play well again the following week is a key thing in any sport. And uh, I think that's what uh, I would be looking for on Sunday night to I see what kind of, a, uh, of an effort we're going to get. See if what we, kind of effort. If be- we come out and we're, we're totally flat, that's not yeah. good. But uh, if we come out and have a nice effort, win or lose, I, th- I think that'll be uh, a, a good thing. I, I think that's the thing everybody looks at, and uh, especially since Jay Cutler's always had a had a tr- uh, tradition of not playing well at night, mm-hmm. and and some people wonder if that's uh, 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 because of his uh, uh, diabetic condition. That his vision isn't as good as night. Oh, maybe night. that's possible. So uh, again, this is going to be one that's interesting. I mean, I look at this and I still say the same thing I said when we started out. I have no expectations on this team. Uh, the, one of the the best games I've seen, say, in the last ten years, happened. I don't know. I think Lovey Smith was the coach. It could have been at the end of Jerron's uh, time there, but uh, 
I know John Thomas Jones was still on the team. I that was the one player that I remember. So that probably probably is the that last was 10 years. that was that was during uh, probably during Lovey. And they played uh, Pittsburgh at Pittsburgh. They lost the game, but it was just a great football game. Played in some mud or uh, a snowy slop, mm -hmm. and uh, just the two teams just knocking on each other and just playing great, uh, as John Madden would say, slobber knocker football. <laughs> and what a great game, even though the Bears lost. So, mm -hmm. you know, if we could see something uh, as good on Sunday, I'd be pleased because I'll be able to see the game on Sunday. Yeah, so. yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to I'm kind of looking forward to this one on Sunday night. Uh, otherwise, college football uh, last weekend after I w watched uh, Michigan uh, uh, escape with uh, their life. I watched uh, Michigan State uh, just kind of roll all over uh, Youngstown State. Um, since I do keep a watch on the Spartans, it was nice to see the Spartans actually score some offensive touchdowns. Mm -hmm. Realize at one point uh, up until uh, uh, Sunday, one of the defensive guys, and I can't think, I should have wrote his name down, I can't remember it now, <laughs> had more touchdowns than the offense. He scored three touchdowns this year, and the offense had produced two. <laughs> you know, even going back to uh, the 66 team, which was one of my favorite all-time teams uh, in college football, uh, and they had some great offensive players with Clint Jones and yep. Gene Washington yep. and Apiza and uh, yep. Jimmy Ray. Uh, you know what? When you look at that team, that was probably still, with those great offensive players, more of a defensive team than an offensive team because sure. you had you know as good as Jones and Washington were you had Bubba Smith and uh, George Webster yeah. and Charlie Thornhill on the other side of the ball and uh, I mean I would say oh if you, you took their pro careers and compared them certainly Jones and, and Washington had excellent pro careers but I'd say Bubba Smith and George Webster's careers careers could would be a little bit better but uh, that was even though I would have thought of that as a really exciting offensive team, they were a great defensive team. Mm -hmm. So, and that ha I guess that hasn't changed. I no. always expect more offense out of the Spartans, but I guess the reality is they've always maybe been more of a defensive and, team. And and uh, um, uh, who's their uh, offensive uh, or defensive coordinator? Pat Capozzi mm -hmm. um, has had a tradition for great defenses. Mm -hmm. And once again, I mean, it's uh, just absolutely outstanding uh, this year. But it was nice to see the offense produce, and uh, actually they, they've gotten down to try the uh, second-string quarterback. Okay. And he can apparently move the ball club a little bit better. So we'll see. By the way, since we were talking before about um, uh, George Preston Marshall and you know mm -hmm. bu buying the franchise for a dollar or the original the original owner getting it for a dollar and, and the fact that Washington was sold for $900 million, Right. Whenever Daniel Snyder bought it, just happened to glance down here in the Sun Times, the on this date okay. section. On this date in 1920, okay, the forerunner of the NFL, the American Professional Football Association, is founded in an automobile showroom in Canton, Ohio. Twelve teams pay a $100 fee to obtain a franchise. I believe it was a Hupmobile dealership. It was a Hupmobile dealership. Yeah. Yes, a hu whatever that is, a Hupmobile. I, I don't know, but wouldn't you like to have one of those Hupmobiles that was in that dealership? Yes, uh, if it was in mint condition, I'm sure it's worth a lot of money, I'm Jim. Sure, I'm sure it is. Man. Well, what else should we talk about, Mr. Massaro? Anything else on your mind football-wise, or should we progress on to other little oh. You know, nonsense. Did you notice, Jim? I, I know you don't. I, I tell you, I wish you would come into that library because I, I got to get, get over there more. I'll tell you, one of the things that always fascinates me is the uh, who who buys the books. Mm -hmm. And I guess what it is, it's uh, uh, different uh, people who are librarians, and you know, because they they're mm -hmm. broken down into circulation and mm -hmm. the answers desk and all this. Different people have different responsibilities, but uh, I guess what I notice. Because uh, I, I like history, and I, of course, you're, love sports. Yeah, very there much There are so. more and more books on those subjects, and I assume on every other subject, where they're finding these little niche pieces of history or sports that are very interesting, and they're writing about them. Right Such now, as? Right now, there's, there's two... two sp uh, uh, there are new books that are sports books on the shelf. One of them deals with... Uh, 
a minor league baseball team. I think it's in, I want to say it might be Fargo, North Dakota. It's in North Dakota, so it could be Bismarck. Fargo be. is the Red Hawks, if I... Uh, right now. But the, back then, oh, back then, this was okay. a guy who was uh, he decided he was going to stock the team. And he had Satchel Page and a number of, oh, of okay. other Negro mm -hmm. League All-Stars on the team. And uh, I guess, every, I mean, uh, obviously that was a sort of a different thing. And then there's another book about the Southern League, which uh, and uh, this would have been somewhere in the 60s, where you know black play black players were more prevalent, but mm -hmm. not as welcome as they are maybe now. Mm -hmm. But the team was the uh, Birmingham Barons, mm -hmm. and uh, Johnny Blue Moon Odom was on the team. A another guy that uh, I don't know if he had his baseball card, Tommy Reynolds, who was a he played a little bit with the A's, uh, I think, in the 60s. Yeah. And th there was another jo uh, player that was mentioned that who I can't remember, but Talking about, I think it was night. I don't know in the in the sixties when that team was the Southern League champions, and you know p these authors are finding these niches, these little fascinating things in the history of uh, various events, and uh, I t I, to me, I just think they're fascinating things. You know, uh, that's why I, that's why I ordered the Steagles book from another library because I always knew that the Steagles. And then another year there was Card Pit, which was one of our own teams, the Chicago, Chicago Cardinals, Cardinals and the Steelers combined. And you know what's really interesting? You know, you, you hear the name, okay, the Steagles, okay, the teams combined. Okay, fine. It's all history now. But as you read what's going on, you think, okay, they had to have co-head coaches, Greasy Neal and Walt Kiesling. Mm -hmm. One was the coach of the Eagles, the other was, was the Steelers. Right. So instead of getting rid of one of them, they had co-head coaches. That wasn't the smoothest of uh, of deals. You had X number of Steelers and X number of Eagles, obviously. That wasn't uh, that smooth a transition. Where was the team going to play? Uh, who was going to get the majority of the games? Uh, it ended up to be Philadelphia. And actually, officially, NFL calls that season, the team in NFL uh, history calls it the Eagles. The Eagles... Uh, so, uh, so the Steelers, the Steelers don't exist. That season. they really didn't exist. Technically, oh. didn't exist. But uh, you know, everybody thought. calls them the Steagles. Uh, or put it this way: if you look at the NFL, they may call them Phil Pitt or Pitt Phil, whatever, mm -hmm. in the NFL records. So you, you hear about all these sort of interesting things, but when you start to get into the nuts and bolts of it, of the thing, it's like, oh yeah, I didn't think you know about that problem cropping up, or I didn't, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, they played three games in Pittsburgh, one exhibition and two regular season games. The rest of the home games were in Philadelphia. So you really basically had a sort of a traveling situation for home games. And uh, most of the guys, I guess, were working in war, uh, war plants. Yeah, during, uh, during the war. This was the so part it, of the war it, effort. It's it just an interesting situation, at least I think so. And... Uh, uh, some uh, a lot of uh, the next book, and I guess it actually is in the library. The one that I want to read is about uh, the the uh, baseball in World War II, where everybody knows you had a lot of the older players, and then you had young guys. Joe Nuxall, I think, played when he, he was, was sixteen or seventeen. I think he might have even been fifteen. It's possible he might have been fifteen. He might have been just short of his sixteenth birthday. And you had Pete Gray, who one only arm. had one arm. So it was an interesting thing. And the Cubs won the pennant. And the Cubs won the pennant in 45. So, uh, you, remember, you remember the great quote from Warren Brown about the World Series? No. As he assessed both the Cubs and the, the, Cubs and the uh, Tigers at mm -hmm. that when they were asked him, when they asked him, um, which team do you think is going to win the series? And he looked at whoever asked that question and said, neither team neither <laughs> okay that was in a that was a good commentary about it so you know what i was going to say i don't know if uh this is uh kevin doesn't always like this but uh i was i was telling you earlier just as long as you we, don't just long as you don't say that one word i'm not going to say that word mm -hmm. but as long as i mentioned it to you before we even came inside i was at the cafe in the library this morning mm -hmm. and i don't know the gentleman's last name i know his his first name is joe but he's one of the of the proprietors and he does the baking and and whatnot uh, is a very uh, sort of eclectic sort of a guy when it comes to music and I, I told you that he had a Irish Irish band. Uh, so a group playing Irish folk songs but they sang Sing them in French 
Uh, that was one of the records that, or not <laughs> records, but the, I assume it was a tape or right. some kind of or CD, a CD or something. And then uh, he also had a really, uh, I should have recognized it, but uh, I, I don't always recognize all the old blues artists that well, but he had a Muddy Waters tape. And I actually, what I was hearing, I liked. And I asked, I said, Joe, who is that? He goes, oh, Muddy Waters. But uh, very, very, uh, he's got a guitar that he sets up against the wall. And he said he's played over the course of his life, and he's not an old guy. He can't be more than, he's probably in his mid-30s, 40 tops. He's just a He's lad. been in 15, 16 bands, I guess, that have played throughout the city. He said some of them were fairly well-known. I mean, not not cutting records and stuff, but well-known in the city. Interesting guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, music, I know that you're a big fan of music. I know, mm -hmm. what was the last thing that you guys went to see, music-wise? We went to see... Um, um, right at the end of the Ravinia season, we went to see uh, Ramsey Lewis and Natalie Cole. Ramsey Lewis and Natalie Cole. Okay. Ramsey opened up the show. Ramsey was as great as always. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it was it was uh, Dana has gotten to be a big fan of Ramsey Lewis. When um, uh, we went to see this winter, she, we happened to get tickets from something through the College of DuPage. And their their uh, performance arts center was being renovated, so things were at the Tivoli Theater in mm -hmm. in downtown Downers Grove, and we were sitting in the third row. And and I joked when the Ravinia schedule came out, and I noticed that I said Ramsey Lewis is going to be there, uh, and her eyes lit up, and I've been joking ever since because I said, well, I have to get tickets from that for that because Dana loves her some Ramsey Lewis. <laughs> how how uh, old is Ramsey Lewis? Ramsey, I looked it up. He is in his mid-70s. Okay. And the thing that surprised me the most to see uh, Natalie Cole was I looked at it later. Uh, I looked, her, looked it up on uh, Google later. Natalie Cole is older than us. Mm. Natalie Cole was born in 1950. Well, you, you know what, the Jim, the, she, I think she, my impression always was that she became popular a little, I mean, most uh, singers probably want to hit it when they're probably in their late teens, early 20s. And my impression was she always was, she was probably 30-ish or she so. She was later 20s when she did uh, uh, This Will Be. Okay. Uh, when I started to place the, that time-wise, and I guess I thought she was younger than that because uh i was a big fan of her father uh nat king cole well he was a what a smooth smooth just uh, a singer he was smooth singer and and uh uh left us much too much too early i think he was in his mid 40s when yeah. he died you know i always thought now the thing of, i remember when i'd see nat king cole of course smoking was not like the taboo that it is today right but you'd see him on a variety show you yeah, know a whoever it was and he'd always have he'd be play you know because then he'd play the piano mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. but he'd always have that cigarette mm -hmm. and actually you know our president they they say that uh his voice is sort of enhanced because he's a smoker and that, mm -hmm. that little bit of smoking gives him that uh some kind of a uh, you know, a, a richer tone, maybe. And I, I think uh, Nat King Cole had pretty much the same type of a thing. I think Mr. John DeVito. wants to say something you know, here. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you a little story about Nat King Cole. Okay. My dad uh, worked for Buick, for Broadway Buick at Hollywood and Broadway. Sure, I never remember and, that dealership. Okay, and uh, he had to go to Detroit, Michigan, because he was on the advisory board. Mm -hmm. And after he got up in the morning, he went down to the cafeteria to get breakfast. He was sitting at the table eating his breakfast, and this gentleman comes up and says, uh, would you like to have company? My dad says, yes, and it was Nat King Cole. Oh. And my dad says, what a great, great person he was. Mm -hmm. He says he just talked and talked and talked, and, and then he, he wrote out on a piece of paper uh, that wherever he was performing that that my dad could go there that night and and uh, oh, get wow. into the into the show on that piece of paper that that he was like a napkin or something oh, wow. you know. my dad said that he was really a great great person you know John uh, I know that you've heard this we've all heard this that uh, I remember my dad but not just my dad but a lot of people would say Frank Sinatra obviously he had a good voice but the thing about Sinatra is he sold the song. But when I think about Nat King Cole, they don't say that much mm -hmm. about him. But when you think about him singing a song like 
unforgettable the way yeah. he sang mm-hmm. it. Yeah. He mm-hmm. really, so, you know, he really sold yeah. a song mm-hmm. as well. It may be a little bit different way than Sinatra, but he sold it. It's just the yeah. same. Sinat- now, Sinatra had the punch. Yeah. Uh, Nat King Cole had the finesse. Now, Frank Sinatra was the patron saint of the radio station I used to work for, WJJG. Right. Joe Gentile and That's Frank right. Sinatra were very good friends. And one night they had uh, uh, doings at the Wrigley Field where they had Frank Sinatra's son sing the Star Spangled Banner. And I met Frank Sinatra Jr. Uh, Joe Gentile uh, went up there to talk to him. And I knew as soon as I knew that well, Joe invited me to go with him mm-hmm. that night to Wrigley Field. And as soon as I knew that we were, I was going to meet uh, Frank Sinatra, I brought my little tape recorder with me. And I have right here in this room here the interview with Frank Sinatra Jr. and Joe Gentile. Oh wow! wow. And uh, okay. oh, what he was a real he was, <laughs> he was a very nice person. <laughs> and Joe asked him a couple of questions. He says, "Well, yeah." He says, "But I couldn't get away with that when my dad was." <laughs> <laughs> he uh, he did a uh, junior did a wonderful show a number of years ago at uh, Ravinia uh-huh. for a fundraiser for the Highland Park uh, Youth Entertainment uh, mm-hmm. or Youth Education. There was a, a fundraiser they used to do. Yeah, and he did you know again songs my father sang and yeah. he he mm-hmm. admitted right up in front. He said I am not going to be up there here doing an impression of my father. Mm-hmm. He said what I hope to be for all of you is a pleasant remembrance yeah. mm-hmm. of my dad. Yeah. And he said, and I can tell you great stories mm-hmm. about my father. Yeah. That's good. And so, and he told one, and he did Strangers in the Night. Yes. And and he said that... It brings tears to your eyes. Well, he did it, and he said, yeah. I have to tell you one thing. He said, this was the biggest hit my father had. Mm-hmm. He hated this song. <laughs> <laughs> well, he can used you imagine, to, Jim and, and, and John... One of the things that you, the, these entertainers, uh, it's amazing. Uh, I think that uh, Jerry Lewis was saying that Dean Martin, the song, uh, That's Amore. Yeah. He said Dean Martin became, as you said, uh, about Sinatra and Strangers of the Night, Dean Martin got to the point where he hated That's Amore. But you, he knew you had to sing it. I mean, yeah. if he, you're going to play he, in front of people, yeah. they want to hear it. Yeah. But, you know, how you know how do you... I can understand. I don't like it. If you go to a show and you see whatever the performer is, and they perform the song that you want to hear them sing, and they sort of jazz it up or do a different version, mm-hmm. you don't like it. But you know, from their point of view, it's like, man, I've done this thing how many thousands of times, and I am getting bored with it, so yeah, I got to yeah. do it a little different. Young Young uh, Junior said that uh, the dooby dooby doos he put at the end <laughs> was to make fun of the song. Just to end it, and he said for the last twelve years that his father toured, Junior was his conductor. Mm-hmm. And he said down near the end, Dad wouldn't remember the running order of the show, so he'd finish a song, come back, kind of lean into me, and go, "What's next?" And I'd tell him, "Strangers." When I'd come to that point, it would be "Strangers," yeah. and all I'd hear is, "Oi!" <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I tell you, it was it was really an honor. Uh, to be with Joe Gentile, God rest his poor soul. He was a great. He was a great guy. I met I, him a number I, of times at Loyola games. Oh yes, a lot of, was just there. a really nice guy. There. Yeah, Oscar and I used to take him there all the time. Yeah, well, we Joe was we Joe was sitting right down in his usual that's seat. That's right, right, right there in the center court, right down in the Coca Cola seats. Yes, that's right. Yeah. I I'd be sometimes over on Press Row helping a friend of mine do it again, do the game Ac- across the across yeah. the aisle yeah. over there. Okay, sure. Yeah. I, maybe that's where I've seen you before because yeah. I we were there all the time. I, I I probably did about three or four games with mm-hmm. him over there. Did, helped did him. Did you up. guys right. ever hear? Uh, 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 you know, you'd hear Joe in the morning, and then sometimes you'd hear him in the afternoon as well. And he used to have a bit uh, that he uh, used to have from a Jackie Mason album or show that used. I mean, Jackie Mason. He'd say, you know, everybody says that Henry Kissinger is one of the smartest guys in the world. He goes, but how does anybody know? You can't understand a word the man said. And then he would do his Kissinger impression, and I mean, you would just die laughing. I was, Thank God I wasn't driving. I was. I tried to hide those tapes of Jackie Mason because he was not my favorite. Oh, uh, Jackie May. I I've seen Jackie Mason mm-hmm. two or three times. Yeah. On his one man show, 
probably one of the funniest men uh, in the world. Uh, I, I tell you, hilarious. it was an honor being with Joe because I tell you, gentlemen, I met a lot of great people. Oh, I, uh, I, I've had, I have my picture of sitting out in the truck with uh, Secretary of State Jesse, Jesse White. Uh, Judy Partithika, I mean, this Judy side of this, yeah. this side of the face here, which is loaded with kisses every time she comes to the studio on, <laughs> on Thursdays. Uh, uh, no wonder you like her, Jack. Oh, yeah. She, <laughs> she, yeah she, okay. She, she's she's Jack. I, yeah. like, I like a Berwyn bride. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I, I, met, I met a lot of uh, Frank Sinatra Jr. I met, and uh, there's just a lot of great entertainers that, uh, yeah. you know, I, I, I met through the year, ten and a half years I was with, with Joe. Did you ever hear the guy he used to have on? I don't know his name, but he had a guy that he used to get on that used to do the best Harry Carey impression I ever heard. Oh, Was yeah, that Jim yeah. Volpin? Uh, Was oh, it Jim uh, Volpin? Um, no, wait a second. Um, uh, Dino, Dino Taberi. Was oh, okay, yeah, because yeah. Jim Volkman mm -hmm. did a really great one. He used to do a lot of things with... Uh, Kevin Matthews. Yep. Oh, Kevin Matthews. Okay. I, I love a good Harry Carey. Yeah, I, uh, of course, I love Harry Carey better than anything. But yeah, you know, yeah, I was, I'm, I was very, very good friends with, uh, with, with him. I used to sit there. I used to be the engineer when, when he'd be up there, and and he would do his uh, talk about and uh, God, I mean, if 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 you were in another room and, and were listening to it on a monitor, you'd think Harry Carey was in that in that studio. You d he, what, you know? he was very good. Yes, he was. Yeah, uh, Dino, Dino. To Cabarrier, uh, Tiberi or something like that was his name. Sure, mm -hmm. I okay. knew him very well. Well, okay. do you? I was taught when I was talking to this uh, guy this morning, Joe. I said, you know, my dad years ago was a uh, involved in amateur theater, and you get to your see dad, a lot of people. Your dad, who, your dad did, did a very good Tevye. Like he did a good Tevye, which was amazing because he actually. When you think about it, I mean, in all honesty, he didn't have that great of a singing voice, and he took a few lessons over the years at. Uh, you know what? I don't know what. Uh, I think it might have been uh, Temple. Might have still been there. Temple yeah, music. Yeah. Temple in music in the plaza. And I think they had a guy who gave singing lessons. So for that particular role, he took some lessons, and he was able to carry it off. But the point I was going to make is, uh, he was in the, the Norwich Theater Group, and he played in a group called the Temple Players, which was uh, in the Maywood Melrose Park area, and and a few other groups. You know, it's amazing, Jim, how many talented people there are. I, I don't care if you take the entertainment world, the sports world. You know, you would see people who had knockout voices, uh, were excellent actors. You know what I think happens, though? Somebody gets caught in that in the working, uh, you know, treadmill, if you want to put mm -hmm. it that way. And you get to a certain point in life where you really, it's hard to get off of it, you know, because you, you're used to that paycheck coming in. So, you, you know, my hat's off to those people who pursue acting, singing, you know, a uh, career as a pro in professional sports. What people don't really realize is how many of the, you always hear the story about Hollywood, you know, every restaurant you go to, waiters and waitresses who are out of work, actors and actresses. They're trying to make it, and they have to do uh, something to feed themselves. And you know what? Those are like... A thousand to one, or, uh, more than the the people who make it. If I'm saying that, I the right I way. would always I would always laugh, especially in my days uh, uh, working for uh, 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 Keller Williams, a couple of Keller Williams real estate franchises here. Mm -hmm. um, when we'd go for our uh, annual convention or the things during there, and sometimes, sometimes if you just looked at the website of the offices in Beverly Hills and that. <laughs> You'd see, you had to see a lot of out of work names? out of work actors. Oh, out of work actors. Okay. Because because they have their headshots out on the website, <laughs> something in between. And and uh, you know, in fact, it was funny. Now that I mention that, I used to do a, a tax return for a guy who was a an actor and a real estate agent in the Chicago area. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, it, it's you, you know what, uh, Jim. The uh, what was I going to say here? Well, uh, I'm sorry, I, I lost my train of thought. But uh, at any rate, uh, it's it's there are quite a few talented people out there. I uh, um, I'm just kind of looking at the time, and since we've kind of gotten off on the off the sports beat, but um, talking about talented people and and especially uh, uh, maybe somebody who's not around with uh, anymore. I uh, saw something last night uh, on uh, Facebook and heard a lot of it and read a lot of reminiscences and heard a lot on the radio uh, about the passing of a guy who was really kind of a, a broadcast legend 
in, in Chicago, who uh, passed away over the weekend, Jerry G. Bishop. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. He, he passed away on Sunday. And Jerry G. Bishop, uh, uh, for those who might be, might be younger, as most everyone is to us now. Sure. Jerry G. Bishop originated, uh, for those of you who are uh, horror movie fans and watch uh, that, Jerry G. Bishop originated Sven Gulli. Yeah. He was the first Sven Gulli. Jerry G. Bishop was a great disc jockey back in his days on WCFL when they were competing against uh, WLS and had some time, uh, uh, did some time over on WMAQ Radio 2. Uh, a great guy, very, very funny, very original, uh, was great with the drops, mm-hmm. with the little comments. And in fact, today, uh, uh, a buddy of mine who um, known for a number of years, and Mike and I always uh, get together and celebrate our birthdays since they're about two weeks apart. Uh, Mike, uh, when he would do the fundraising auction for the church and school, that was in the neighborhood where we lived, uh, when he'd host the fundraising, when he would host the fundraising auction, he'd always wear a bad tuxedo, a very loud, garish color tuxedo, and either a pair of gym shoes or a pair of sandals. And he said that was his tribute every year to Jerry G. Bishop when he used to host telethons. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, you'd see him out there when nobody would be calling, and he'd be playing his guitar. And he'd have a tuxedo on and sandals. Oh, uh, what was, uh, what, what did Jerry G. Bishop, what was the cause of death? Uh, Jerry was 77 years old, and he had, didn't hear anything of it, but I know he had a stroke a number of years ago. And then there was another uh, radio legend that passed away this weekend also. He was, him and his wife did a show Don, on... Don Wade. That's right, Don Wade. Yeah, Don Wade. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. mm-hmm, they uh, that uh, was uh, uh, that was like uh, last weekend. Uh, d- d- oh, that was last weekend. Yeah. Okay, because yeah. uh, Jack Ryan, when he were talking about the Meet the Chicago historians yesterday, he talked about about him, and there was uh, uh, doings on the. Um, uh, the, on, the, on the website up about him, also he was on WLS. He died of a uh, brain cancer. Yeah, he John was. Uh, he was the one. That, he was the only one they carried over from the rock and roll format when they went to talk. Yeah, Don right, Wade. Right, Don Wade. Wade. That's correct. Yes, John. Yeah. What? What? Uh, what is the Chicago historians? What subject are they on right now? Uh, yesterday we talked, and it was a really great, interesting program we had yesterday it was uh, the american indian the history of the american indians in chicago oh and we had a representative uh from from the from their from their from their people that sat here and talked about it and it was the most interesting uh, uh, uh discussions of discussion like, yes did chief, they talk chief, about chief. the port chicago massacre at all uh mm, john no no I, I mean because that happened at the way i understand that at one of the probably one of the richest uh, pieces of real estate in the city of Chicago, right around Wacker in Michigan, is where for where for uh, Fort Dearborn. Fort Dearborn. I, yeah, that's right. Uh, was and mm-hmm. that's yeah. Well, but th- did, I thought they might have got into this that gentleman a bit. that was here. His name was uh, David. Uh, 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 I think it was David Stewart or something. Uh, his area was right around in the uptown na- uh, neighborhood, right around. Uh, 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 Ashland and um, Wilson is where is where you know where their people are g- gathered. They were downtown and some building downtown, and then they had to move up. They moved up up uh, up west. But it, oh oh yeah, I know. I it, the, the, there was the Indian Center on Ashland on Wilson just off of Ashland. That's right. That's where he's right. That's, that's where he's right. At. I do knew somebody these, who was uh, involved with that. Do any of these guys ever mention mention uh, Richard Crow? You, you remember yes, Richard Crow? Yes, they did talk about him. Yeah. Uh, talk, they talked about him a couple a couple broadcasts ago. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yes. I, I, yep. You mm-hmm. know, I've been looking yeah. for a uh, a book uh, by Richard Crow mm-hmm. because I understand that uh, when I read his obituary, they said that he could take almost any block in the city of Chicago and give you a little history mm-hmm. on it. Th- and I, I found that to be a fascinating thing. I would like to. You mm-hmm. know, I don't know if he ever authored a book that. Uh, I mean, obviously, you couldn't have one that uh, dealt with every uh, block in the city, but you could have a pretty darn interesting book. Now, we have a gentleman that's on a panel for me to Chicago Story. His name was Ken Little. He worked at the, at the uh, he was a dispatcher for the, uh, for the Chicago Fire Department. He worked downtown in the city, in city hall. 
And this man here, there isn't a street corner in the city of Chicago, from Howard to far south, from, from Lake Michigan to the far west, he doesn't know the box number and can tell you a story about what happened in that area. This man is a, a walking encyclopedia of, 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 of the history of Chicago. It Chicago would always fire. interest me, guys. I, when I was growing up, I was always under the impression, we, you know, Chicago had a north side, a south side, and a west side, but, the, you know, the There's lake east was side. east and there was no east. But no east side, but there is an east side. There is an east side. And once you get further south... You, and uh, you start to you get know, the bend. Yep, yeah, definitely. You can wind up going about 30, 100 east. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, one one point I just wanted to make, I got a kick out of it when uh, I sent uh, an email to my friend Mike as he used to honor Jerry G. Bishop with his tuxedo and still does every year when he does it. I said, make sure you carry that on. Jerry passed away, and I got an email back that kind of put one of his drops in there. That he used to use, they used to hear on the air. I just see the words, and it was always done with a Jewish lady, with a Jewish lady going, "Give him some chicken soup." Yeah, that, and I he'd do go, remember, yeah, I and, do and that. I just, and he wrote, "Give him some chicken soup," and I see, but he said, "Give him some chicken soup." I don't know if that's gonna give him some chicken soup. He said, but he's dead. It it would night. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't <hide. laughs> All right, uh, all right. I think we had sort of a. Interesting I, rambling I it. I on it. Uh, back and forth sort of thing Let's today. Let's talk about the Lone Ranger next time or something. Or how about uh, you know what it was? You, you asked me what was on my mind when we started. I said, the Lone have you seen the movie The Seahawk lately? No, I have not. Okay. All right, Let's that'll see. be that'll be in two weeks. Okay. In the meantime, we thank you for listening to us. This show will air on Monday, September 23rd from 7.30 to 8.30. By golly, I think I'll listen to us. Yeah, that's that's a good idea. We'll be the only two probably. <laughs> All right, thanks for listening to us. We'll catch you again next time. Bye-bye. Guys. You have been listening to Armchair Experts from the John Nevada Broadcast Center on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network with Jim Leon and Rich Massaro. This broadcast was directed by John Nevada, edited by Stephen Lehman. Audio engineer is James Rohde. This broadcast was pre-recorded on Tuesday September the 17th. Thanks for listening and catch you next time.